welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is episode 11, Brian Baru, the Battle of Clontarf and its aftermath. This show not only contains the final part of the story of Ireland's most famous medieval king, Brian Baru, but also the story of what is unquestionably the most famous and misunderstood battle in Irish history, which was fought at Clontarf in 1014. Before we begin this exciting journey from the year 1000 that will take us through to 1022, it's worth saying you might want to listen to the previous episode if you haven't done so yet, as they are heavily linked. In the early months of the year 1000, the Viking settlement of Dublin was in ruins. A few months earlier, the Vikings and their allies in the Kingdom of Leinster had revolted against the rule of Brian Baru, who was the overlord of the region. The revolt had ended in disaster, with Brian leading an army into the settlement, which then proceeded to ransack the city. Now, while they set about rebuilding the settlement, something that was becoming all too familiar for the Dublin Vikings, they and their former allies in the Kingdom of Leinster had to prove their loyalty to Brian Baru. He had chosen them to spearhead his most audacious plan to date, a surprise offensive on the O'Neill High King, Muel Shocknell. The background to Brian's planned attack in 1000 began three years previously, when in 997 he had achieved what many had thought impossible. After 20 years of attacks and war, he had forced the O'Neill High King, Muel Shocknell, to accept his rule over the southern half of Ireland. In a thousand, however, he was going to gamble it all. He was planning a surprise attack on Wales Shocknell. Effectively, Brian was aiming to become the first man outside the O'Neill kingdoms to become High King. Brian had planned his attack carefully. It was going to happen in two waves. First, he had chosen a cavalry force of the Dublin Vikings and Leinster men to perform a lightning raid which would then be followed up by Brian and the main army. As the Dublin Vikings and the Leinster men prepared to ride out and launch this attack, no doubt checking horses, sharpening blades, they must have said a quick prayer. They were about to embark on what was an incredibly dangerous mission, one that could bring them great fame and prestige, but could also easily get them killed. As they thundered out of Dublin, Many of the observers did not see potential glory in their mission though. Moving north across the Liffey, along dirt tracks, through farmlands, peasants peering out from mud cabins must surely have groaned at the sight. As the ground shook with the gallop of horses, it was obvious that this signalled the end of the peace treaty between Brian Baru and Wales Shocknell, and heralded an uncertain, dangerous future, particularly for peasants. The war that would begin a few hours later would no doubt mean armies on the move, requisitioning food, destroying crops, raiding and slaving. There was no good outcome in this war for the poor. All that might happen is they'd get a new master. For the soldiers themselves, they cared little or understood the lives of peasants or the poor. In this raid, they saw a chance to emulate their forefathers, to add their names to great lineages even if it meant pain, misery and suffering. Over the few hours' ride north, they must have wondered, were they on the precipice of greatness in history? Where would this war take them? Would they be the ones to finally end O'Neill hegemony over Ireland? The answer to where would this war take them, for many of those horsemen, was simple. A bloody field not far away, because as they moved into southern O'Neill territory, Well, Shocknell showed that he was not as weak as many might have thought he was. Facing down this advanced cavalry, the O'Neill army cut them to pieces. This was clearly not what Brian had expected. And when he arrived up with the main force, he didn't find Well, Shocknell softened up by the raiding party. But instead, he found his raiding party butchered and cleaved, and now was confronted by an O'Neill army competent after their victory. Unsure of the outcome of the battle... Brian chose not to fight Muel Shocknell and found himself withdrawing back out of the southern O'Neill kingdom. This retreat, though, had not been part of the plan. It was clear the wheels of his great surprise offensive had fallen off 
And as the year 1000 closed, Brian must really have wondered, had he blown it? He had failed to take advantage of the surprise element of his attack. Indeed, in many ways, he had actually come off the worse. All he had done was effectively put the O'Neills on notice, saying, you better get ready for war. Now in Wales Shocknell would prepare for war. He would seek allies, prepare defences. He wouldn't be caught out again. Brian must have worried that he had just woken a sleeping giant, riled him up, and in the process, sown the seeds of his own destruction. The following year of 1001, Wales Shocknell and the Southern O'Neills began preparing for the war that had been foisted upon them by Brian. Before his three years of peace with Brian, they had fought for decades, and Wales Shocknell knew that Brian, having always had the upper hand in water, would inevitably attack up the Shannon River. Now for Brian, this was easily done. He had numerous Viking allies. If he could do this, there was a great tactical advantage as he would split Wales Shocknell from his main ally in North Connacht. Cahal Makrohor Maktaig. Mwail Shocknell could not allow this to happen, and early in 1001, he and his ally Cahal constructed an impressive fortification across the River Shannon, blocking the river. For the people at the time, this must have been an amazing project. What exactly was built is hard to know. Perhaps it was a fortified bridge, although around this period, bridges were a rarity. It's also possible they just did something like anchor trees in the riverbed, which would have made the Shannon unnavigable. Nonetheless, it was an impressive feat. Well, Shockland must have known though that this would not be enough. He would also need an army to defeat Brian when he inevitably became overland. Brian would not be as easily fought off as he had been the year previously. Now, no matter how difficult building a fortification in the River Shannon was, it was no match for what he had to do next and that was to try and forge an alliance with the major military force in Ireland not already in Brian's camp. This was the Northern O'Neills, a kingdom technically under Mwail Shocknell's authority, but the brittle unity of the O'Neill kingdoms had been shattered by constant internal wars between 950 and 970. By the 11th century, the Northern O'Neills were effectively an independent power from their southern counterparts, Regardless, Mwail Shocknell, a desperate man, sent envoys on what was a diplomatic mission that could test the skills of any negotiator. On their route north, these envoys had a lot to think about. They must have been acutely aware that rivers of blood had flown between the northern and southern O'Neills since the 940s, the last time a unified O'Neill army had regularly taken the field. Initially, it seems, the negotiations went well. A certainly entertained the idea seriously and convened a council of war. In what must have been a tense meeting, the case was put to the Northern O'Neill, many of whom had lost family members in the decades of war that had raged between the Northern and Southern O'Neill kingdoms in the mid-10th century. Back in Meath, Mwell Shocknell must have been on tenterhooks. In many respects, his authority, or lack of authority, would be laid bare in this moment. He would only remain High King realistically if the Northern O'Neill chose to back him. Otherwise, he would face Brian alone and almost surely lose. His future depended on the outcome of these negotiations. In a world with no email, telephone or telegram, word only travelled in what must have been agonisingly slow form from Wales Shocknell by horse or on foot. He must have watched riders come in and hoped against hope that they would have good news. But when it arrived, it was a devastating no. A and the Northern O'Neill would not come to Wales Shocknell's aid. He would fight alone. This news must have stunned Gaelic Ireland. At his disposal, Brian had Vikings from Dublin, Waterford, Wexford and Limerick a veteran army from Munster, as well as soldiers from the kingdoms of Ossory, Leinster and Southern Connacht. Even with the Shannon blocked, it would be an immense task for Mwail Shocknell to stop this. But for Brian, his moment had truly arrived. In medieval Ireland, the opening months of 1002 must have been incredibly tense. 
Since his rebuff by the Northern O'Neill, Mwes Jocknell and his sole ally in the West were essentially sitting ducks. How Mwes Jocknell must have cursed and swore A and the Northern O'Neills. But as the year progressed, Ruing lost chances was of little use when Brian Baru began preparing for war. Brian could easily see Mwes Jocknell was vulnerable and isolated. He marched to the crucial point where the O'Neills had blocked the Shannon at Atlone. It was here he was confronted by Mwes Shocknell's force. The outcome of this conflict was never in question. And ever the realist, just like in 997 when he had made the treaty with Brian, Mwes Shocknell seems to have realised the game was up. From the annals, it seems there was actually very little fighting between the two armies at Atlone. Indeed, it would have been pointless. The game had really been up since the Northerners had refused to back him, and now the time had come for Mwes Shocknell to accept he was no longer the most powerful king on the island. In perhaps one of the most symbolic moments in medieval Irish history we have yet covered, the Southern O'Neill army under Mwes Shocknell submitted to Brian Baru. This, in some ways, must have been a huge anticlimax. It was for me reading it. We've covered 200 years of warfare largely waged to preserve O'Neill dominance. But then, in the 1002, Mwes Shocknell gave it up without much of a fight. Now, it's probably the correct decision, as he would have in all certainty have lost. But nonetheless, it must have taken people aback at the time when he submitted to Brian. For Brian Baru, fight or no fight, this was truly momentous. He had forced the great Southern O'Neill into submission. For a man who had been on the run from the Limerick Vikings as a boy 50 years beforehand, this achievement was outstanding. In a modern global context, a comparable achievement would be something like if a country forced the US to submit to them. While Brian could claim to be High King, given he had just taken the submission of Mwes Shocknell, the reality was that his power and control over large sections of Ireland was still far from complete. Three kingdoms the Northern O'Neill, Argilla and the Ullad still held out against him. These could not be easily dismissed. The Northern O'Neills in particular had been a major force for centuries and there was no way the ageing Brian could rest until he had dealt with the threat that they posed. With Will Shocknell neutralised, Brian's eye focused on Ulster, but attacking the North would be a double-edged sword. While the threat the Northern O'Neills posed was too great to leave unchecked. If he was unsuccessful and the Northern O'Neills did hold out against him, they could become a major threat, potentially even topple Brian. They had, after all, supplied nearly every second High King for two centuries and given half the chance they'd do it again. However, if Brian could break the resistance of these Northern Kings and force them to submit as well, his achievement would be unbelievable. It would be the promised land, bringing every major kingdom under his control. Something so rarely done, even by the greatest O'Neill High Kings. But to do this, he would need to fight a war that would not be short or easy. A major problem for Brian was that the Northern O'Neill, at this point, were a relatively unknown quantity. I kind of picture them in 1002, like the Soviet Union before World War II, in that they hadn't fought a major war in decades, had gone through much upheaval, and while they were seemingly in decline, they did have a great history, so no one knew what to expect. Predictably, Brian, buoyant after his victory over Mwes Shocknell at Adlone, decided he would press on and try and end all opposition, and take on the Northern O'Neill. Just like our World War II analogy, however, Brian had completely underestimated the opposition he faced, and when he attempted To cross into Ulster, his route was blocked by a joint hosting of not only the Northern O'Neills, but also the other kingdoms of the North, who so often and frequently fought each other. This was a seriously impressive opposition, and Brian was not willing to risk everything he had achieved, and according to the annals of Ulster, he withdrew without a fight. This decision to withdraw probably reflected the relative weakness of Brian's power in 1002. The reality was that Mwes Shocknell, regardless of his submission, would strike against Brian if the chance presented itself. Likewise, the rest of Brian's supposed allies were not exactly loyal, particularly 
the notoriously independent Dublin Vikings and the Leinster men who had already revolted as recently as 999. Now had Brian lost a major conflict against the Northern O'Neills, what was a shaky alliance could easily have unravelled. The following year, it seems Brian was unsure what to do. Well, at least he didn't act decisively. But in 1004, an opportunity to break the resistance of the North presented itself. The Northern King's show of unity in 1002 was pretty rare. And soon the old tensions that defined relations between the Northern O'Neills and their neighbouring kingdoms resumed. These relations usually took the form of the Northern O'Neills trying to dominate the other kingdoms in the region. But of all the times to try and control their neighbours, when faced with such a major threat from Brian Baru, you'd think they might have sat back a while. However, sitting back wasn't in the vocabulary of the Northern O'Neills, and on September the 14th, 1004, they crushed the neighbouring kingdom of the Ullad in a major battle south of Belfast near modern-day Lisburn. This defeat seems to have been catastrophic for the Ullad. The king, his two sons, and according to the annals of Ulster, the elite of the Ullad were all wiped out. For Brian, when he heard this, it must have been unbelievable news. Not only had the Northern O'Neills gone and destroyed their main ally, but in a strange, inexplicable event... The king, A, seems to have been killed as well. Now, in an event that shrouded a mystery that today would probably launch a thousand conspiracy theories, the Canaleon, the ruling dynasty of the Northern O'Neills, claimed to have killed A themselves, although this does seem very unlikely. Whatever happened, Brian Baru probably couldn't have cared less who killed A. The reality of the situation now was that the Northern O'Neills were in turmoil, and as sure as day follows night in Munster, Brian made preparations for war. As he prepared for the march north, Brian received further good news. Moel Shocknell, technically his ally, but also the man who presented the greatest threat to him, had fallen from his horse while preparing to join the campaign, and according to the annals of Ulster, he lay mortally ill. With Moel Shocknell struggling on his deathbed, this removed any fear that Brian must have had that should things go wrong in Ulster, Moel Shocknell would attack him. The conditions seemed perfect for war, where Brian could finally end all opposition against him. He chose the quickest route north, up the west coast. At the upper reaches of the Shannon, they moved into what was hostile territory. Fear must have gripped the less experienced warriors as they moved through the increasingly mountainous north against what was a tricky, tenacious enemy. The northern O'Neills were long known as ferocious fighters. They wouldn't give in easily. From the perspective of the Canaleon, own, the dominant dynasty among the Northern O'Neills, this was as much their moment as Brian's. While they might have been in disarray, they still prepared for war. They selected a new king, Flabberthuck, and they were not going to simply sit back and allow Brian Baru march into Ulster. He would have to fight for it, and they went out to meet him. They carefully chose their spot. At a beach in modern County Sligo, Throck Dohali, near Balasadair, not far from the distinctive mountain of Ben Bulban, they decided they would make their stand. Here the hills came down to the coast and Brian would be forced to pass through a two-kilometre stretch between the beach and Schlievedeen. Sure enough, Brian eventually appeared, but he was now faced with no choice but a serious battle. And, not for the first time, he decided against fighting and turned heel, returning south. This decision was strange, to say the least. Why he withdrew is certainly not clear. This was the second time when faced with a northern army that Brian had not fought. Presumably he had hoped the northerners would capitulate without a fight when he appeared, but this hadn't happened. By withdrawing, though, he looked weak, and it seems that he was only creating a bigger problem for himself in the long run. The longer he did not face down the northern kingdoms, the stronger the new Northern O'Neill king, Flabberthuck, would get. Indeed, Brian's inability to militarily defeat Flabberthuck would haunt him for years to come. As he returned south in the depths of winter, the mood among his army must have been low. No doubt as they withdrew from Troc 
the Northern O'Neill's taunted the army of Munster. That winter, Brian must have pondered the situation he faced in relation to the North. He couldn't leave it alone indefinitely as a symbol of opposition, but he clearly didn't seem keen to fight them. Some other way would have to be found. Finding another way under the military conflict in medieval Ireland was nigh on impossible, and as we shall see, although Brian searched for a non-military solution, the best he could find was not good enough. As 1004 passed into 1005, the new year gave Brian options. Well, Shocknell, supposedly on his deathbed, lingered on and indeed didn't die, but it did take him years to recover. This suited Brian best, as it gave him space from any potential threat from where Shocknell could pose. In this space that he now had, he turned to political intrigue to force submission from the Northern O'Neills. The Christian Church in medieval Ireland had become heavily embroiled in politics. In this situation, it was little surprise that over the centuries of O'Neill dominance, the northern ecclesiastical settlement of Armagh effectively became the capital of the church, although, just like the O'Neills, it had long faced opposition from an ecclesiastical settlement in Munster, Emily. Now when Brian came to power, this must have worried many in Armagh, because Brian had patronised the rival monastery of Emily. They must have surely worried that Brian might try and move the authority of Armagh to Emily, as it would no doubt help shift the centre of gravity of the political world from the north to his home kingdom of Munster. Just as Brian reached his impasse with the Northern O'Neills in 1005, the Korab, or the head cleric of Armagh, Murakhan, died. How Brian would react was key to this situation. Now, although the exact chronology of these events isn't entirely clear, I think it seems likely that Brian saw an opportunity in the situation and probably offered to support the supremacy of Armagh in return for them pressurising the Canal Owen into submission. It seems likely that the clerics talked or cajoled the Northern O'Neills around because when Brian visited Armagh in 1005, strangely it seems the Northern O'Neills submitted to him without any major fight. Although he did technically have the submission, on one level it was entirely unsatisfactory. In Gaelic Ireland, war was part of politics and this strange manner of gaining submission did not create a lasting peace. Brian had in no way defeated or in any way limited the power of Flabberthock and surely Brian himself must have known and most of all Flabberthock knew that this would not last. It wouldn't take long before Flabberthock would revolt. Brian's use of the church to twist the Northern O'Neills into submission in 1005 did not solve the problem he really faced with them. The Northern O'Neill king, Flabberthock, saw himself as a potential candidate to become a figure like a high king and he would never accept Brian's authority unless militarily defeated. Power in Gaelic Ireland was based on physical violence, or at least the threat of it and the unusual manner in which Brian had obtained submission from Flabberthock probably wasn't going to cut it. In an attempt to reinforce his authority in 1006, Brian did gather a large army and headed north, and crossed into the remote Canal Connell Kingdom in modern-day Donegal. Tensions on this royal tour must have been immense. No matter who had submitted to whom, Brian clearly wasn't welcome in the north. Now from the Canal Connell Kingdom, he crossed the foil, and moved into the Canal Owen Kingdom. After this, he went into eastern Ulster and eventually returned south. While he could laud his authority over these northern kings, Flabberthock in particular had a long-term plan that would eventually see him end in conflict with Brian. The fragility of the situation was laid bare the following year, when Flabberthock finally and inevitably rose in revolt. Before he could ever think of facing Brian directly, he needed to consolidate his position in the north and in 1007 he attacked the Ullid and took hostages. This was a direct challenge to Brian as he was technically overlord of the Ullid. It was this crisis that finally forced Brian into action and his retribution was swift and sharp. The previous years of avoiding conflict had not blunted Brian's ability to go on the military offensive when he had to 
Flabberthuck had misjudged Brian, who immediately moved into the north, and according to the annals of Ulster, he took the Ullid hostages back from Flabberthuck by force. This was more like it from Brian's point of view. This was what would work with Flabberthuck, who had clearly underestimated how far Brian Baru was willing to go, and found himself now on the back foot. The following year, he paid the price when Brian appeared in Ulster for the fifth consecutive year. On this occasion, he finally broke the Canelo Owen rulers, who handed him over hostages in a thousand and eight. This was a momentous occasion for Brian. Stunning, really. His perseverance had paid off now that he had forced a meaningful allegiance from the two great historic powers of medieval Ireland, the Canal Owen of the Northern O'Neills, along with Moya Shocknell, obviously, of Clan Coleman, the dominant power in the Southern O'Neills. Standing alone now against Brian was the Canal Connell Kingdom, a lesser branch of the Northern O'Neills. Geographically and indeed politically, they were quite isolated in modern-day Donegal and presented very little threat on an overall level to Brian. But he was in no mood to compromise. In 1011, the Canal Connell faced a situation no other kingdom in Ireland had ever faced. A raid against them was not only Brian, but Muel Shocknell and now Flabberthuck, illustrating Brian's great power at this point in time. Remarkably though, the Canal Connell and their king, Muel Runig Ua Muel Dorig, held out. Brian unleashed what was probably the most formidable alliance ever to take the field to date in medieval Ireland. Flabberthuck first of all led an invasion force with Mwerkud, the son of Brian. They seemed to have carried out a punitive raid early in the year. They returned with 300 captives and many cows. The whole event was overseen by Brian and Well Shocknell, who were camped on Loch Foyle. It seems that this raid was probably designed to soften up the Canal Connell, because later in the year, Brian himself, then an ancient man, entered the territory of the Canal Connell at the head of an army. They tracked down the king, Muel Runig, and took him back to Thomond, Brian's home kingdom, where he would pay homage. This was the definitive moment in Brian Baru's career. Although extremely old, and probably looking slightly out of place at the head of an army of young warriors, he had finally subdued every kingdom on the island. As he returned back to his stronghold at King Cora in the Lower Shannon region, with Muel Runig, King of the Canal Connell in tow, he must have reflected on what it had taken to get to this position. Five decades of war had taken him from a man who had looked like he wouldn't survive the 960s to being among the most powerful men in medieval Irish history. He had seen it all, and while he had suffered setbacks, most notably the execution of his brother, Machamon, in 976, he had struggled on. When the O'Neills had more or less imploded as a force in the late 10th century, and then the Vikings had faded in power, Brian had been there to take full advantage. In 1011, he stood tall, having succeeded at what many would have deemed impossible. While this achievement was momentous, Brian must also have known that his rule was also pretty unstable. In the typical medieval fashion, he had not displaced any of his enemies. He had just forced submission from them. So, where Shocknell and Flabberthuck still remained in power, and these two in particular felt that they had the right to be High King. To make matters worse, Muel Shocknell and Flabberthuck despised each other, which just made the situation even more volatile. Indeed, it was the tensions between these two that would start the process that would see Brian's power collapse. Despite his five years of attacking and then ultimately subduing the Northern Kings, Brian had never resoundedly defeated the major Northern O'Neill power, the Canal Owen, and their king Flabberthuck in battle. This, along with Flabberthuck's own designs on power, led to a tenuous relationship, and it was only a year after Brian had captured the king of the Canal Connell and become one of the most powerful figures in Irish history that this power was shaken by Flabberthuck. Having had enough of being beholden to Brian, in 1012 he made another play for power. This meant, as usual, firstly reclaiming authority over the north, and in 1012, Flabberthuck attacked the Canal Connell, the other branch of the Northern O'Neills, 
as well as the Ullad, a kingdom in East Ulster. Both kingdoms had already submitted to Brian, so Flabatok was clearly undermining Brian's authority. These actions showed clear intent. As Flabberthock flexed his muscle twice that summer, when he ravaged modern-day Donegal, taking cattle and wealth, and then attacking the Ullad, no doubt Mwell Shockle began to look on nervously. In 1012, Mwell Shockle must surely have been looking to the future. He had supported Brian Baru now for nearly a decade, presumably hoping it would be he who would ultimately succeed him. Brian was now in his 70s. Like, this is extremely old for the age and it was clear he would die soon. Worryingly though from where Shocknell, with Flabberthock in revolt, this could put everything in jeopardy. Indeed, if he was not careful, where Shocknell could lose everything, were Flabberthock to sweep in and seize power from him. At the very least, Flabberthock was creating a very unstable situation, one that must deeply have worried Mwell Shocknell. In an effort to curb his power, when Flabberthock was on the warpath, Mwell Shockland attacked Tyrone, the homeland of the Canal Owen, which had been left undefended. Undeterred, however, Flabberthock just pushed on with his campaign that summer and invaded eastern Ulster. As the north was being drawn into an open conflict, the outcome was increasingly unpredictable. The situation seemed to be escaping Brian. Things deteriorated even further later in 1012 when news arrived in that Leinster had renewed their old alliance with Viking Dublin. They too were rising against Brian. The storm clouds of war were brewing. Brian, now very nervous, could see the dangers and even resorted to fortifying his own kingdom of Thomond, which hadn't been attacked by a major force in a long, long time. Times in Ireland were clearly changing. Whether they rose independently of each other or as part of some joint plan, the revolts of the Northern O'Neill and the Leinster men supported by the Dublin Vikings in 1012 ensured that Brian's rule in a large section of Ireland was collapsing. Muel Shocknell, king of the Southern O'Neills, was still faithful to Brian, but now he was trapped between the two forces in revolt and it was he who initially paid the heavy price. In 1013, he was attacked by an alliance of Viking Dublin and Whale Morda, the King of Leinster. At modern-day Coolock, in North County Dublin, they killed Muel Shocknell's heir, Flan. That same year, Flabberthoch invaded from the north, leading an army to Kells, where Muel Shocknell would not fight, but indeed backed away from the increasingly energetic and much younger Flabberthoch. This was all very worrying for Brian Baru. If he didn't act soon, he could lose almost everything outside of Munster and in the summer of 1013 preparations were made for what must have seemed like yet another war in an endless series of conflicts for Brian Baru. Since he was a boy he had never known peace although arguably this was as much his fault as anyone else's. Nevertheless Brian still led his army from Munster setting out for Dublin to try and bring the rebellion under control. As his army moved slowly east to Dublin, they ravaged the Kingdom of Ostry. Examples were being made. Revolting against Brian Baru was a costly business. On the route to Dublin, Brian also dispatched his son and would-be heir, Murkud, into Leinster, where they raided the monastery of Glendalough before sweeping down from the Wicklow Mountains to join the full army of Munster and Brian outside of Dublin. Breaking the resistance in Dublin was crucial before Brian could ever think of taking on Flabberthock, who was now raging across the north. In September 1013, as Brian looked at Dublin, things had changed since he had last tried to take this city. Thirteen years earlier, in a crucial step on his path to power, he had stormed the city after his great victory at Glenmama. But this time, things were very different. Well prepared, perhaps supplied from the sea, the Vikings would not relent now. Learning from the numerous sackings the city had suffered, the Vikings now had adequate fortifications. Brian set down for a siege, but the Dubliners would not relent, knowing that a grim fate probably awaited them. Three months elapsed, and there was still no movement. And by Christmas, Brian Baru had to accept he was not going to take the city that year, and the siege was lifted. 
The march back across Ireland in late 1013 must have been pretty depressing. The army couldn't but have felt the situation was starting to escape them. They had stood outside the fortifications of Dublin and just were not able to break in. Brian's kingship was dwindling. He seemed unable to enforce his authority. He now faced a potentially dangerous situation with the Northern O'Neills in full revolt, pressing his ally in Wales shocked and hard. He could soon face a direct threat if Flabberthock was to emerge victorious over in Wales Shocknell. 1014 was a make or break year, but not only for Brian, but for numerous other powers who all had so much to play for. In Leinster, Muel Morda and his Viking ally Citric, the King of Dublin, were no doubt buoyant after their victory. In the north, Flabberthock was on the crest of a wave with his sights set on power. Meanwhile, between the two, Muel Shocknell hadn't yet given up the ghost. 1014 was going to be a very interesting year as all these tensions came to a head. In early 1014, in Leinster and Dublin, they knew Brian would return that year. However, they were boldened by the political situation around them and the fact that they had successfully resisted Brian in 1013. They were going to make a stand, but allies were needed. To this end, both Muel Morda, the King of Leinster, and Citric Silkenbeard, the Norse King of Dublin, agreed to source allies for the inevitable war that would arise that year. This saw Citric, the King of Dublin, set out in the depths of winter, through rolling seas and howling rain, to journey far into the north to the Viking settlements on the Orkney Islands. There, huddled around fires, in the brutal cold of these Viking outposts, he convinced the Viking Jarl of Orkney, Sigurd, to come and fight. Incidentally, it's this Norse word Jarl where the word Earl comes from. After this, Citric sailed south into the Irish Sea to the Isle of Man, where he also enlisted the Viking chieftains, Broder and Ozpak. On returning to Dublin, he must have been elated. This force was a foundation of a major alliance, something that could tip the balance against the now weakened Brian. However, arriving into the Viking harbour at Dublin, his opposition must have been tempered somewhat. Muel Morla, the king of northern Leinster, had failed in an attempt to secure the help of the Akinshadigs of southern Leinster. Any dreams of inducing the still semi-reclusive northern O'Neills to commit to a battle came to nothing as well. Nonetheless, by April 1014, the Viking mercenaries Citric had secured began arriving from the Orkneys and the Isle of Man. There was little or no rooms within the walls of Dublin to provide for the thousands of warriors arriving and they camped a few miles north of the city near modern-day Hoth. The city must have been heaving with excitement and energy, however, and when the main force, well, more than army of Leinster arrived, it was clear that Brian Baru was now facing perhaps the most serious threat of his entire career. This revolt had turned into a full-scale rebellion against his rule and overlordship. Separate from this, he also faced the situation in the north and the reality that Muel Shocknell seemed increasingly unable to stand up to Flabberthock. In April 1014, Brian had been reduced to relying on Viking allies from Limerick and Waterford and two small kingdoms in southern Connacht. Nonetheless, he began to make plans to move to face down the army now building outside of Dublin. As he moved east across the country, he dispatched a small force under one of his sons, Dunica, into Leinster, well more of this kingdom, as a diversion, while moving the main force on to Dublin. When he arrived, he skirted around the city and camped just to the north of the settlement, in Tomar's Wood, in modern Fibsborough. Here he was positioned between Dublin and the assembling army north of the city. Inside Dublin, Citric Silkenbeard, the king, was no doubt on edge. From the city defences, he could have seen the fires of Brian's camp, now just north of the city. If Brian emerged victorious this time, Dublin would inevitably fall. There would be no way back for Citric. In a thousand sea, he had fled Dublin after a failed revolt against Brian. He had returned, however, and after submitting to Brian's authority, he had been reinstalled. But in 1014, surely there will be no way back. 
Brian would not forgive him a second time. However, the die was now cast, and north of the city, two huge armies were camped within a few miles of each other. All the people of Dublin could do was look on and await their fate. If Brian won, the city would more than likely be ransacked directly after the battle. On Good Friday, 1014, the inevitable clash of perhaps two of the greatest forces ever assembled in Irish history to that date happened at Clontarf, north of Dublin. The site of battle was east of Brian's camp in Fibsborough and south of the Leinster Viking army camped towards Hoth. Brian, now in his 70s, clearly could not lead an army into the battle. That privilege fell to his son, Murkud. He commanded a force comprised of soldiers from Munster, supported by warriors from Connacht and Vikings from Limerick and Waterford. Whether and where Shocknell came to support them is debatable, as the sources disagree. Some say he came, but on the eve of battle left after a dispute with Brian. With or without Mwell Shocknell, they faced an army led by Mwell Mortha, the King of Leinster, backed by numerous Viking allies, Sigurd, Ospak, Brother. However, conspicuously missing from the affair was one of the architects of the situation, the Viking King of Dublin, Citric. He remained within the city during the entire conflict. To arrive at the battlefield, neither side had to travel very far, scarcely a few miles. The conflict seems to have been evenly matched. However, when Will Morther's army of Leinster and their Viking allies moved south to the battlefield, they lined up with their backs to the sea. With Brian's army, led by Mwarkad, approaching from the west, this would prove fatal. When the battle was joined, the Leinstermen and their Viking allies were pinned between the sea and Brian's attacking army with less room to manoeuvre. According to legend, the battle lasted all day until the evening with ferocious casualties on both sides. Towards evening, the Leinster and Viking army line began to falter. In medieval warfare, damage was done when one side broke and began to lose cohesion and retreat. This was the moment everyone feared in medieval battle, because once an army turned to flee, they could no longer defend themselves and were vulnerable to a rout. At Clontarf, as they faltered, the Leinster Viking army had nowhere to go, as they were pinned between the Munster army and the sea. Chaos and carnage reigned, and the Leinster army and their Viking allies were annihilated. According to all sources, their army was routed and losses were tremendous. As the victorious Munster army saw their vanquished rivals on the field, the soldiers' minds no doubt started to focus on the inevitable sack of Dublin that should have followed. But they probably couldn't have realised just how hollow this victory they had just scored was. The army of Munster and their allies had just scored the classic Pyrrhic victory. Lying dead on the battlefield was Murkud, the heir to the ageing Brian's throne, who had been groomed as his successor. His death was compounded by the fact that many prominent leaders in the army were also killed. As they walked away from the battlefield, covered in blood, worse news was to follow for the warriors of Munster. In the chaos and the carnage that followed the end of the battle, one of the Viking leaders, Brother, escaped the battlefield with some companions. As he fled back towards Dublin, he came across the camp of Brian Baru. Now how exactly Brother and his companions got to the ageing king is not known. But once the opportunity presented itself, this Viking didn't need to think twice. And Brother killed Brian Baru on the spot, bringing an end to the life of one of the greatest characters of medieval Irish history. For the army of Munster, their great victory was now turning into a nightmare. They were fatally crushed despite their victory. Much of what Brian Baru had struggled for was actually lost. By defeating the Vikings and the Leinstermen, they had eliminated a threat, but in the process, they had also weakened themselves so much that they could no longer maintain their power. Their victory was so costly that they could not even take advantage of the fact that Dublin was lying less than a few miles away, almost completely defenceless. Another of Brian's sons, Donica, took command and led the weakened army back to Munster, carrying Brian's body with them. 
Even on the way back south, though, their diminishing power was evident for all to see. They say bad news travels fast, and it seems that the word of Brian's death moved faster than the returning army. And when they reached Ossery, a kingdom that had been ravaged by Brian in 1013, they suffered a revenge attack. Although they did survive, it was a sign of things to come. It was clear the dominance of the Dalkosh had been shattered. Carrying on to Thomond, great plans were set in motion for a funeral, and Brian's body was taken to Armagh to be buried in a move to reinforce the fact that he had been a great king. Despite all the symbolism of his funeral and the location of his burial in the holy site alongside many O'Neill high kings, nothing could hide the fact that that the Dalkosh and the Kingdom of Munster were fatally weakened in his absence. Before we look at the aftermath of the battle, it's worth taking a few moments to analyse Brian Baru's life, and more importantly, the impact that it had. Brian Baru has become the most famous medieval Irish king, without a shadow of a doubt. Indeed, he is arguably the most well-known Irish historical figure outside the 20th century. He is without question, though, one of the most misunderstood figures as well. Much of what is attributed to Brian is myth. In the 12th century, Brian's descendants wrote a pseudo-mythical account of his life called the Cugga Gwael Regolov, and this formed much of the later histories written of him, including works written in the 20th century. Histories influenced by the Cugga Gwael Regolov Pitch Brian as an almost unique king of Ireland who liberated Ireland from the Vikings at the Battle of Clontarf. This analysis of Brian and the Battle of Clontarf could not be much further from the truth. Hopefully, by this stage in the podcast series, it will come as little surprise that by the Battle of Clontarf in 1014, the Vikings had become a much diminished force in internal Gaelic politics. If Brian had not won the Battle of Clontarf, the benefits of the victory would most likely have fallen to Mwail Morda, the King of Leinster, and not the Viking mercenaries who fought for him. Although no doubt the Vikings would have perhaps enjoyed greater influence had Leinster become a more powerful kingdom. In light of this, when analysing Brian's life, it's important not to see the Battle of Clontarf as anything to do with driving Vikings from Ireland, since they had long become an integral part of Gaelic society. Clontarf was essentially about the waning power of Brian Baru, other than anything else. Another often repeated claim about the battle was that it was the cause of the machinations of Brian's former wife, Gormla, who was also the mother of Citric, the Viking king of Dublin. This is totally implausible and reflects a repetitive sexist theme often featured in medieval histories, where evil women are blamed for a great loss. The reality is that Brian had reached his high point in 1011 and it was all starting to fall apart by 1014 and the Battle of Clontarf was a result of this. A fact often forgotten is that although not on the battlefield that day, the shadow of the Northern O'Neills breaking Brian's control over the North loomed large over the events. Indeed, Brian's personal power is generally overstated. As we have seen in this episode and indeed the last one, he did not unite Ireland He did, however, successfully subdue numerous independent kingdoms on the island for a brief period, and this was no mean achievement. But this is a very different idea than the nationalism and state building often attributed to Brian. Indeed, Brian Baru would not really have understood these concepts. Indeed, it would be centuries before anyone would. The only fair way to judge any historical figure is by the standards of his own time. By contemporary standards, Brian Baru's achievements were outstanding, although they were not unique. Flan Sinna, the great O'Neill High King between 872 and 916, did attain similar power after he effectively destroyed his main rival, the Ogonacht Kingdom of Munster, at the Battle of Balak Munya in 908. Brian's achievements lie in the fact that while his power was not unique, he had broken the continuous power of the O'Neills that had lasted for centuries and he had done so from relatively humble, if still noble, origins. But Ireland, after Brian, was still deeply fractious like it had been before him. This is reflected in the fact that there can be little doubt that the O'Neills, both the northern and southern branches, would probably have celebrated on news of Brian's death. 
He would, however, have been mourned deeply by his own family and perhaps wider Munster because in 1014 there can be little doubt about the fact they faced a deeply, deeply uncertain future. In the years before Clontarf, Brian had clearly been lining his son Murkut to succeed him. At Clontarf, though, not only had Brian been killed, but so too had Murkut. This created a power vacuum, and although the throne did pass to another son of Brian's, Dunica, he was not able to fill this power vacuum at all. He was no match for his father or his brother. Almost immediately, the former kings of Munster, the Ogarnacht, sensed the weakness and went to war against the Dal Kosh in late 1014. While an internal struggle within the Dal Kosh kingdom broke out between Dunica and his half-brother Taig, the fortunes of Brian Baru's kingdom of the Dal Kosh and Munster in general plummeted. In this environment, the real victor of Clontarf was not Brian, was not Brian's sons or the defeat of Vikings, but Mwael Shocknell, because he in effect became the High King after Brian's death. In the eight years after Clontarf, Mwael Shocknell re-established O'Neill's supremacy. Although he seemed so threatened in the two years before Clontarf, Mwael Shocknell was the dominant power after it. Quickly after Clontarf, he even managed to win the Northern O'Neills over to his side, and in 1015, he and Flavartuck launched a joint raid into Leinster. Perhaps at this stage, Flavartuck realised that regardless of their differences, they had a similar enough external policy, and more importantly, Muel Shocknell, at the age of 66, would not live very long. Fighting him now would not be useful. Instead, he could help him build up a big power that maybe Flavartuck could take over when Muel Shocknell died. In 1017, Muel Shocknell built his strength even further when he was able to enlist the Dublin Vikings in the defence of Meath when the King of Leinster attempted a revenge attack. While he built up this power, he faced almost no threat from the kingdom Brian Baru had struggled to build up over the previous five decades. In 1019, Dunica, Brian's heir, was too busy trying to survive an assassination attempt by his own kinsmen to even think about trying to stop Muel Shocknell. In 1020, perhaps Muel Shocknell's crowning moment arrived when he attacked West to bring the kingdoms in Connacht back under O'Neill control. In the O'Neill army on that campaign was Dunica, the son of Brian. Muel Shocknell had unquestionably returned to the top of the pile, but his rule was really harking back to the past rather than something that could be replicated into the future. Ireland was changing and the high kings who would dominate the entire Ireland were a thing of the past. Two years later, at the age of 73, in the year 1022, Muel Shocknell MacDonald died. With Muel Shocknell passing, we can say what can be described as an age of Irish history comes to an end. Although no one at the time could really have had the foresight to see it, Muel Shocknell was the last great O'Neill High King. Indeed, he was the last of his family, the Clan Coleman, to produce a powerful king. Soon, the dynasty that produced Flan Sinna and Muel Shocknell I would disintegrate, and their kingdom of Meath, which had been the backbone of the Southern O'Neills for several centuries, would be forcibly split up. Muel Shocknell's death witnessed the true arrival of a multipolar world in Gaelic Ireland. No longer would the island be dominated by the O'Neills of the north or the kings of Munster in the south. As we shall see in the upcoming episodes, kingdoms in Leinster and Connacht we're about to step out of their relative obscurity. Next time we will begin the story of what can be seen as the twilight of the old Gaelic world. Because 150 years after Muel Shocknell's death, Gaelic Ireland was irreversibly and dramatically altered with the arrival of the Normans in 1169. Until next time, Slán. And don't forget to follow the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Irish History Podcast.